getting accepted into Sundance is a big deal because of its reputation and the platform that it gives to voices in independent film. Having the film accepted into Sundance, I'm honestly just filled with gratitude. I'm grateful to be here. With Sundance being, you know, one of the most prestigious film festivals for independent filmmaking, it makes perfect sense for Adobe to be here to really support or educate that independent film community about what they're offering. Everyone's making lower and lower budget films, and the bar of the quality of those films is rising. Everything that you need to do fits within the Adobe product. You don't have to go anywhere else. When I'm editing, uh, which I often do, and also doing sound mixing and uh, simple color grading, I have the access between programs in such a, a much more simple format than it was on any other programs that I was using before. The film was edited exclusively on Adobe Premiere. A lot, if not almost all, of the effects work was done in After Effects. It's pretty exciting to be talking to Adobe. We taught Matt a little After Effects, and yeah. he kind of picked it up pretty quickly. We used a lot of archival material in the film, so uh, Premiere was able to really handle the different codecs, the different file formats in a way that was, you know, just much, much less work. There's a lot of people that I talk to now, and they're like, what do you edit on? And I say Premiere, and they're like, yeah, that's what I use. Filmmakers are empowered now. They can get a hold of equipment, they can get a hold of editing suites, and they can create their own work. And if they want to, they can just put it out on the biggest network in the world, and that's the internet. Adobe's involved in supporting a community, and supporting an art form, and helping it develop on a grander level. And being part of Sundance shows that. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Megan Keen and I am from Adobe. Welcome to Lights, Camera, Edit, directing with an editorial eye. I am super excited about this panel because not only are the three filmmakers who are here extremely talented writers, directors, editors, um, but they're also super interesting <laughs> and very insightful as I've learned over the last couple of weeks as we've prepared for this panel. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to those filmmakers. First of all, we have uh, David Lowry. He is a filmmaker from Texas. His films as a director include Saint Nick, Pioneer, Ain't Them Bodies Saints, and Disney's Pete's Dragon. As an editor, he worked on Bad Fever, Sun Don't Shine, and Upstream Color. This year, his film, A Ghost Story, is playing in the next category here at Sundance. And here is the trailer from Ain't Them Bodies Saints. Dear Ruth, I dreamed about you again last night. I hold your face in my mind. I think about your hair getting longer. I think about your belly getting bigger. I think about our baby girl. I shot someone. I think I shot someone. It's gonna be okay. All you gotta do is wait for me. I'm confused, Ruth. I don't know why you kids did what you did. What do you want to do now? I'm gonna wait for him. It's gonna be all over the news later. Thought best to you hear this to my friend. Hear what? I know you know I'm out, and I hope you know I'm coming for you. Just like I always said. I'm putting into all this right now all by myself. All I'd have to do is tell the truth. Whatever it is you've done, when I see you with your daughter, all I see is good. Maybe I'm just fooling you. People talk about regret, but I haven't got any. I traveled high and far, and now I'm close. I'm so close to you, I can almost reach out and touch your cheek. Girls, you got trouble. 
Well, maybe you get out of town until all this blows over. You mean until he gets caught? Have you seen him? Sure haven't. We can make it. We can make it if we run. Every day I wake up thinking today's the day I'm going to see you. And one of those days, it will be so. And then we can ride off to somewhere. Somewhere far away. Please welcome David Lowry. At Sundance 2015, Jennifer Pong's sophomore feature, Advantageous, won a U.S. Dramatic Competition Special Jury Prize. The film was acquired by Netflix and nominated for an Independent Spirit Award. A sci-fi drama about the future of women, Advantageous was the feature adaptation of Pong's ITVS award-winning short by the same name. This year, Pong directed episodes of The Exorcist on Fox and Major Crimes for Warner Brothers Television. Pong's debut feature, Half-Life, premiered at the 2008 Sundance Film Festival, screened at South by Southwest, and was released by the Sundance Channel. Here is the trailer for Advantageous. Okay, so, who out there thinks they have an imagination? Everyone? Okay, everyone. Close your eyes. Here at the Center for Advanced Health and Living, we are working to offer you the safest alternatives to invasive cosmetic surgery. Mom! I hope you think you're pretty. Sometimes. Now, let's imagine living 40 years with a club foot. We're obligated to go a different direction for the face of the center. Am I too old? But on your 50th birthday, you're a professional ballet dancer. I got a call yesterday. About the race? How's the job search? $40,000 would get us through the next month. I need Please, to go. The procedure you're launching, use it on me. Now open your eyes. That world is here, and it's yours. Why did you have me? You had to struggle so much. You make me very happy. Please welcome Jennifer Pung. And finally, Kyle Patrick Alvarez is a Los Angeles-based writer-director. His writing and directorial debut, Easier with Practice, won him the 2010 Someone to Watch Award at the Independent Spirit Awards. His second film, COG, was the first movie based on the work of David Sedaris. It premiered in competition at Sundance in 2013 and was released in theaters by Focus Features and Screen Media. In 2015, The Stanford Prison Experiment, his third feature film, was released theatrically by IFC Films after it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, where it won the Alfred P. Sloan Feature Film Prize and the Waldo Salt Screenwriting Award. 
This year, he directed three episodes of the new Netflix series, 13 Reasons Why, produced by Tom McCarthy for Paramount TV. And here is the trailer for the Stanford Prison Experiment. Would you rather be a guard or a prisoner? I don't think I have the qualities to be a guard. Prisoner. Prisoner, I guess. Prisoner. Sounds like it would be a little less work. Prisoner. What's that? Nobody likes guards. <laughs> Good afternoon, gentlemen. This experiment will be an extension of my research into the effects prisons can have on human behavior. You're going to be pleased to know that you all have been chosen to be the prison guards. But when in no circumstances whatsoever are you to physically assault the prisoners in any way. So remember, just as you were watching the prisoners, my graduate staff and I will be watching you. All right, gentlemen, we all have ourselves a lot of fun. Rule number one, prisoners must remain silent. This is an exercise period. OK, is it just me, or are these guys taking this thing a bit too seriously? Why don't you give me 20 push-ups? <laughs> Look at this guy. He thinks he's John Wayne or something. You address me as Mr. Correctional Officer. This might be an interesting two weeks after all. Why don't you make up your bunk, 8612? I did, Mr. Correctional Officer. Well, that's not what I see. Hey, what are you doing here? Just make that! What was that? You just hit him. You're not supposed to hit him! Should we step in? No. Let the guards figure it out. Let's see where it goes. Good evening, gentlemen. How about we make this one a night to remember? This is all real. They won't let you go. They won't let us leave. Those are not prisoners. Those are not subjects. Those are boys, and you are harming them. Please welcome Kyle Patrick Alvarez. So, all three of you uh, started your careers as editors, though you had uh, aspirations to direct. Um, starting with you, Kyle, why was editing the entry point for you? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I had been using, you know, like in college when I would do shorts, they had these really old Avid systems and you would have to rent time to get on them and you would only get like an hour thing here or there. And at the time it was when the little uh, Pixar looking iMac came out. And so I got one of those as like my college computer and then it was, you know, I was using Final Cut Pro at first. Um, and, uh, and so I had a system at home and this was back when we were digitizing mini DV and it was nightmarish and it was really difficult, but I got to spend all my time inside of an, uh, inside of an editing software. And that was probably like a majority of what I learned. Like I certainly learned more about editing than I did about being on set in college. And so by the time I moved to LA, um, I had a firm, firm enough grasp on editing to really, uh, you know, pick up jobs. They weren't exciting ones. They were, you know, editing like industrial videos and commercials and videos for nonprofit organizations and things. It wasn't creative work, but it, but it paid well and it gave me the opportunity to start, uh, you know, writing and preparing for my features. And how about you, Jennifer? Uh, I, after college, was interning in North Carolina on a documentary and what they needed was producers who could edit. So uh, I stepped in and... and um, in college, I found I fell in love with the process. I, I liked obsessing over it. It's something that just kind of came naturally, and I could do it on my own without people bothering me. So um, it just naturally folded itself into a little bit of a profession. And mine, my story is almost exactly the same as Kyle's. I just you know, got one of those early Macs with the Final Cut Pro and, and taught myself how to do it and became a way to make a living. And then I just, I really enjoyed it because I'm a very, I'm a massive introvert, so I just got to sit in the dark by myself and, 
And it's also, I, for me, the most fun part of the process of filmmaking because you just get to smash two things together and see what comes out of it. So I really enjoyed that, and that led to making you know uh, some some movies as an editor, working as an editor for a while. And uh, but it was all you know again learning process for directing my own films. So to a certain extent, the accessibility of of editing as a way in really helped you guys sort of get into the business that you were striving to be in. It, it, I think it's because it's a trade as much as it is. I mean, you could say the same about directing, but it's not, you know, it's like whenever I meet people who are interested in getting in the industry and they're like, oh, my dream is to be like a casting director. I'm like, great. You know, like, good. <laughs> You've got like a direct through line, but similar to people who are interested in being an editor. There's, there is, that's not to discourage people who want to direct, but it is, it's always good to have something that's a trade and a skill that people really need. And it's, it can be technical. There can be, jo- you know, specific job opportunities for smaller, you know, especially when you're, 21 and there was there was this opportunity there how do you feel that that experience and and i'll go even so far as to say expertise because all three of your very talented editors has informed or influenced you as a director or even as a writer um it affects me uh like deeply probably i mean i would say that that's uh i in some ways start thinking as an editor first and foremost um even down to the point where it's like I'm budgeting a new feature and there's a lot of montages and I would love to be able to shoot them all, but you know, we have 20 days to shoot the movie. So it's like, Oh wait, I know what, you know, it's deciding editing. It's like pulling scenes that you would love to shoot, but you know, you probably might not use. And so you're trying to wear those hat, that hat early on. And while shooting, it just comes down simply to only getting the pieces of the coverage you need and, and being able to say, well, I know I'm going to use this for, if it's a 10 minute scene, I'm not going to run the full 10 minutes and all those pieces when I only have, a couple hours to shoot it, you know? So it's, it's kind of starting to think I, I always, I get the most excited and the stuff I've ever always been the most happy with my work has been when the writing and the editing and the directing kind of all overlap and there is no pre-production or post-production. You're rewriting a scene on the day of because something else changed and then you're going to adjust something in the editing because you've got the editor right there or you're the editor and you're testing it out at lunch. And, um, so for me, it's, it's, uh, it's almost impossible to separate the two. Or three, I guess. <laughs> uh, there are two, two points that you made me think of. Um, I think in editing, you can, can do some very distinctive work as a director. And to, to get as specific as you want, um, you kind of need to be in there. Um, if, you're, if you're continuously trying to get an editor to do exactly what you say, it just kind of creates a, sometimes a tense collaboration, depending on who you're working with. So I, I like I like to know that I can get in there and get that spe- specific things, uh, that specific thing. But I will say that I mean the great thing about having been able to collaborate with other editors in on a feature and on other projects is that it is an, it's sometimes an exhausting process, and 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 you of course lose perspective. Um, on on our feature, advantages, my editor, uh, my co-editor Sean is here. You know we would trade off. The, we would trade the. The cut. We would go into visual effects. We would produce visual effects. We come back to the cut. We give each other feedback. It was constantly. It was always flowing, always changing. Um, and that rest time would give us better ideas and made a better film in the end. But the other thing it made me think of was. Um, wait, what did you make me think of? I'll come. To, I'll come back to that. <laughs> I'll be back. I mean, yeah. I just uh, editing um, is how I think, and so uh, when I'm writing a script or as Kyle said, planning a budget or being on set, it's always with the, the cuts in mind. So I, it's it, nine times out of 10 that's helpful. Every now and then it is detrimental, but I'll take the, the benefits more than the, the detriments. I remember one more thing. Because a lot of people here are probably independent filmmakers or people interested in making their first indie film, um, knowing, uh, knowing that you can edit until it's good by yourself for free is probably a very useful um, thing to know. I mean, it, it, it saved, it, it made my career a little bit. And so, so to those points, how often do you find yourself shooting for the edit or even writing with the edit in mind? It's an interesting, I have so many answers, but I will say that um, depending on like the pressures you have going into production, knowing that you can edit out the mistakes after yourself um, or target it later allows you to go into production. <laughs> um, so because you're always under 
many constraints. Um, that kind of flexibility is a good thing to have. Um, I do write with editing in mind, and um, but I, I know I have to be there to kind of make it, to kind of push it all the way. I, mean, I don't know if that's that different from being a, a director, directing editor. But. I mean, like, definitely writing for the edit, but when you're on set, I do find myself sometimes like saying, okay, I'm just gonna let, let let's do the 10 minute scene from every angle. Let's, let's, let me just live in that for a little bit. But while I'm doing that, then I'm like, okay, that line reading was great in take two. I'm gonna take that and put it into take four. And so you, you, nonetheless, even if I'm trying to like let myself breathe a little bit in terms of like just being in the shooting mode, I can't help it. I'm still just like piecing it all together. Yeah, there's been a few times where I've tried to do that. Like, oh, we're just, we're gonna shoot, you know, like Stanford especially, like every, almost every scene in that movie has, you know, I'd never shot a scene with more than four people in it. Talk, or six people I think was the most. And that was like one day and it was like the most nerve wracking thing on COG. Stanford, that would be our smallest scene almost you know and so there were some days where yeah you can't get away from shooting coverage right unless it wasn't the movie had it was conceptual in some ways but not in that way like we were going to see everyone we were going to see close-ups of people um and really that ended up uh and editing that there was one scene in that movie and everyone's seen it, it's a scene where they make them do these number counts over and over again i probably have put I probably had to work on that scene almost as much as I did COG like in its entirety, you know, because it was the one time we shot it. Like I wanted it to be semi improvised a little bit more. And we just ran these long, like 30 minute takes. And then it was like, Oh, Oh, this is what now this is. It was a little bit more of like what not editing in the camera was. And it was like terrifying to me. I wasn't, I wasn't particularly, I think it took me that long because I wasn't particularly good at editing that way as, as an editor. I don't think I succeeded there. Um, because it was just this cluster of, of material that wasn't in inherently designed to fit in together. We had to design it afterwards, which didn't make it bad. A lot of people work that way. It was just very new to me. So you also brought up, um, Jennifer, visual effects. Um, so writing, directing, editing, I know that you all have produced as well visual effects. So why is it important for a director to have a clear understanding of all the different disciplines that, that go into making a film? I mean, especially now, you know, when you're working often with really low budgets, or even if you have a, a, a decent budget, it really helps to know what you are asking of people to do, or you need to do it yourself. So it helps to know all these, or at least have an understanding of these disciplines so that you can either talk with your collaborators more freely and openly and like kind of understand, you know, have a more fluent exchange with them, or if it comes down to it where you just get sit down and paint something out yourself, you can do it because sometimes it comes to that. Weirdly, our you know our job is creative, but it's also as much as we want to say we're auteurs, we're we're weighing time and money constantly, and and knowing that this one beautiful little idea is not actually worth it um, because it would be thrown out if you just shot it, um, you know, and knowing that this will this will cost relationship cap capital or um, or capital. Uh, it, Th those are very important, and those are skills that can take you forward to a very long career. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think knowing the process all the way through is super great. Well, and I, I think, too, you right, it's like everyone says, oh, fix it in post, and it's, that's become the negative thing. And I do think that's a negative thing. Like, I don't think you want to be saying fix it in post, but there's this other side of it. It's like, but knowing what you can do in post can save you a lot of money. It can save you, you know, in terms of being like, oh, hey, how long is it going to take to knock on that guy's door and ask him to take down his, I don't know what poster in his window or something that's in the background of the scene versus, oh, I know I got a guy or I can do it myself and it'll cost me $200 to take it out of these frames. It's on sticks anyways, whatever. Like understanding that balance, especially on an indie film, I think can be really useful. Um, and also knowing, we talked about this on the phone, like knowing what that is and knowing what the extent of that kind of VFX work, even because on indies, we're mostly talking about cleanups. Like your film is a very particular and special one that has has these very sort of like awe-inspiring large shots. But in a lot of ways, the small small movies have a lot of, v I mean, Stanford, I think, had like 140 VFX shots. And hopefully there's stuff you would never know was there. And a lot of it was fixes. A lot of it was our set. We were there for three weeks and it just kept on getting destroyed and we didn't have the money to rebuild it. So we were having to paint out people's, when he, people's heads went through the walls, we just have to be, well, we can't fix the walls, so we're just gonna have to paint back the wall, you know? And, and learning that was really, really interesting to see because we ultimately actually saved money because time is money, all the more so when you're on set. And all three of you have recently uh, transitioned 
not necessarily out of independent film, but are expanding your portfolios of the kinds of things you're working on, whether it's you know a big blockbuster or, or te- moving into you know episodic television. Um, do you feel like it's helping you understand where you can push the limits when you're working in um, a different type of collaborative <laughs> process than independent filmmaking? I mean, there's definitely like, when you're working like with like big visual effects companies, like I don't know how to do any of that stuff. That's like all pretty still, that's, that's magical. But you still have an understanding of like what goes into it, you know, the pieces you're gonna give them. And you can go on set and, and like, I mean, we've all at this point seen countless hours probably of behind the scenes documentaries on DVDs. So we all have like an understanding of like, oh, here's what a green screen does. Here's where we use a tennis ball stick for an eye line, things like that. And so you have an idea of what goes into it. and. And then when you have a better fluency with post-production, with the process, it's a, it, it again just facilitates a speed and expediency with which you are you know, dealing with these bigger things that you might not be used to. And then even when you're doing like a big studio movie, like being able to paint something out yourself can wind up happening. I mean, it, it, there are things that I wound up doing on, on Pete's Dragon that aren't, you know, w- you know, at the end of the day, like someone else goes in and finishes them, but in the edit itself, I was able to go in and just like put together some composite shots in After Effects actually, and, um, and illustrate what it was I was after. And being able to do that was, it again, sped things up and was much more clear to everyone than me trying to explain what it was I wanted. I remember Jennifer, you saying that when you were starting uh, when you did the short for Advantageous into moving into the feature, that the tools, the the integration between Premiere Pro and After Effects was something that sort of changed your ability to work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, actually, I think what, it's another step, which was we we came out of Final Cut, went into Premiere Six and, or Premiere Nine or Six, and uh, Six, and then went into uh, Adobe CC. That was a process in itself. But then um, what we loved about uh, creative uh, at Premiere CC was was being able to go, um, you know, take our plates out of the edit, um, create a, an After Effects uh, sequence, and then use the dynamic link and be able to click on into our um, After Effects uh, project from inside Premiere. And so we'd be able to kind of find it without having to search and like, and so th- there was a lot more efficiency. We could. We could change the length of shots. We were be, we were basically able to edit with visual effects while we were cutting, um, and that was a, a big deal for us. And I think made us happy because um, we were we were running out of time to get to premiere in Sundance. <laughs> and David, your film uh, Ghost Story that's here this year, um, similar to what Kyle was saying about you watch a film and don't necessarily see that there's a whole lot of visual effects, but does have quite a bit of visual effects. Can you tell us what's at play there? Yeah, we have a ton of visual effects, and I don't know I don't remember how many there are. Um, and a lot of folks helped us do them. Like one of the, the biggest ones was painting out one of our actors' tattoos, which, and we have like really long shots in the movie, so it's like a six minute shot and we had to get tattoos removed and that, that was all After Effects <laughs> as well. Um, there's things like that. There's some very obvious visual effects, like there's some, there's some sci-fi stuff, there's some weird stuff going on that's very definitely obvious visual effects, but then there's so much stuff that you don't know, like lots of split screens, lots of combining different elements of shots together for various reasons, um, tons of painting things in and out, and uh, and just, yeah, it, it was just a constant process of, again, using the dynamic link thing to send things to After Effects, and if you look at the timeline in my Adobe project, like there's so many shots are just red because they're actually VFX shots, and it's just all sorts of things. Well, like the the, very short anecdote I'll tell. I remember on COG, we were having this problem when we were showing it to people, like no one really knew. I mean, people still don't know what the lead character was doing, but at least <laughs> initially, I'm, I'm okay with that. But you know, initially it was, there was a confusion on the immediacy of it. And so we were like, well, we're gonna have to go shoot a, reshoot a scene because we need him to like make a phone call. And I had cut a, another, a later scene in the film where he does make a phone call, where his eyes are ragged, his hair is ragged, and he was wearing different, he was wearing the same sweater um, but a different shirt poking out. And so I, so we went to some VFX people were like, well, what if you could, and that movie was very low budget, you know, it was three to 400 or 6,000. And so we were like, well, what if we could replace the shirt collar? And the value of that was infinitely cheaper. So even though they were doing the wireframes, they were doing all the things you see in visual effects and mapping it on and everything, which seems high end for a tiny movie, and it was as boring as a shirt collar, it saved us tens of thousands, you know, in, in reshoots because we were, able, and then they were able to clean up his makeup. So it's knowing those tools are available 
and knowing how then those can save you. Like you're saying, like, I, you know, I was working for an editor for the first time in the Netflix series, uh, not myself. I was impressed with how much he was able to do with merging tapes, merging split screens, things I know people had talked about. I just frankly had never, ever had the time to really even play with because I'd always had to turn my moves around so fast. Um, and so it was sort of interesting to see these tools and also like a lot of VFX being Im implemented by the editor early on and a, a lot of compositing, a lot of compositing happening in the editing room, um, you know, so that when it gets shown to Netflix and to Paramount, they're not like, wait, what's going to happen in this scene? So I think as editors, I wish I had a firmer grasp on VFX. Like I wish I had a firmer grasp on After Effects. Um, I think it would help my filmmaking. I think it would... Uh, you know, make me a better editor and a better director. What's really crazy, and this is, I don't know if it's a good thing or not, but when you start thinking in terms of split screens while you're shooting, like you're just like, you're like, <laughs> yeah. rather than doing another take, I'm like, okay, I, that, that, that beat in between was too long, I'm going to take take two and take three and we're, we're good. Yeah. I got it from you, I got it from you, we could just... I mean, I do. I, I do that all the time now. It's crazy. Yeah, it, hap yeah it's, it happens so much. And it's crazy. Or even just like I wanted to shoot um, a slow motion sequence on the Phantom camera on Stanford. And they're like, that's going to be $14,000 a day to rent it. And I was like, oh, we can't afford that. But then there's like a $500 piece of software called Twixter. And it doesn't work perfectly, but it worked for like the four shots. Yeah, we we use that. I, I taught myself that like three weeks ago for a couple of shots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, it's the, there's an immense amount of tools that I think are like really useful that I know I would have told myself, oh, no, I don't have those because I'm an indie movie, when really it's like, no, you should have those because you're an indie movie. So, Kyle, you, you brought up, and Jennifer also mentioned working with editors now. How has, has being an editor influenced how you work with your editors, how you communicate with your editors? Um, yeah, how do you approach working, working with editors who are not yourselves? I have to approach that process very carefully because I feel like, you know, with every collaboration, there has to be a little bit of give and take and, and open-mindedness. And as a director, your impulse is to, to direct every little moment. And, um, and that can be a little bit stifling. So I've been careful. I've, I've uh, you know, tried to pick my battles uh, early on and then manage my time so that by so that I've, I've so I, I work in television now and that's that means I don't get to edit as much and I, I've, I've shared some stories where I've managed to use my use like an Adobe Premiere timeline and show it to an avid editor in order to kind of show him what I mean um, instead of like writing lists of you know in Excel about what the time code is and how things should go um, and that's actually been a much more fluid and organic way to, to, to work with them which is which I Loved and I, I recommend it if if your editors will allow it and not run away and report you to the union. Um, so, which and I'm really grateful that these editors were open to it um, because ultimately they just get more time to do better better work and it's really just about going okay what's in your head let me give it to you and then they can finesse things that they want to finesse. Um, so so finding that kind of dynamic is what I'm hoping to do more uh, more often and be able to kind of say we're we're all great brains here let's let's combine you know. Let's become a big giant robot and, and defeat this thing. Um, so that's a good yeah. analogy. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I found it was weirdly because it was just the first time and it was just this summer, the first time I'd ever worked with an editor, and uh, I really liked it. Um, I know I, my new feature I won't be able to edit for political finance. I mean, multiple reasons. I mean, I'll probably end up editing it again anyway. But I mean, I hope not, but it could happen. Um, but with the TV show, I found it was very similar to talking to actors. Right, you're trying to not tell them exactly what to do because that's disrespecting what they do and their own form and art. So you're trying to imply, you're trying to urge or encourage or suggest an idea or a feeling um, and trying to evoke and invoke that in them so then they come up with hopefully something better than you could have even done. Um, but then sometimes it comes down to an actor hitting a mark. Like, hey, you gotta take two steps to the left and not, not gonna hit the light. Sometimes to an editor you gotta say, look, you gotta add, add six, try six more frames and see if it works. So I think it's about finding that balance between not telling them what to do, but at least initially helping them. I, I, I really, I enjoyed it. I mean, it, it was comfortable. They had sofas, you know, so that was kind of nice. <laughs> um, uh, like, and, uh, and, it was, and it was nice, but I also got lucky. Like I loved the guy I worked with. He was really blunt. Like he would be like, this scene's terrible. I think we should cut it. And, and then it would be like, oh, cool. I like that you said that, you know? And um, it, worked, it worked really well. I was really grateful. I mean, I think there's, for me, I feel like I'm going to edit some of my own projects in the future and other projects I'm going to want other editors. I think it's like a, it's just going to be like a gut instinct of what I think the movie needs. Like I think my television episodes that I did 
wouldn't have been as good had I edited them. But I don't think a couple of the features I've done would have been. So it's a, I guess I'm just going to have to trust instinct on it. I don't really know yet. Yeah, I think, I mean, my hope is to have a relationship with an editor that evolves from movie to movie to the point where, like, I don't ever even have to show up. That she can just send me stuff on pics or whatever, and I'm like, yep, great. But that's not there yet. And, but I do, you know, you have to find someone that you enjoy being in the room with. You have to find someone that you uh, trust and who can learn to speak your language, so to speak. And for me, and I think for all of us probably, it's important to have someone who doesn't mind you getting your fingers dirty cutting as well because that's often the best way to, like, figure out if you're on the same page because it is. It takes a while to, like, you could, you could spend more time trying to explain and edit than it would take for you to do it yourself. So a lot of times for me, like with Pete's Dragon, I would be, I'd just go cut a scene myself. Um, I'd work on them. My editor would work on an, another scene. Then we'd just look at what we did at the end of the day. And having worked as an editor, one of my least favorite things in the early stages was to, was to have the director in the room with me because I was still learning what the footage was, learning what the movie was, getting figuring it out for myself. So I don't ever want to be the director who's just hanging out you know, in the background, just like watching the editor learn what the movie is. So I wanted to make sure when I'm working with an editor, they have that space. And while they have that space, I'll probably be going and doing the same thing, learning what the movie is. I think a quote from David uh, in our earlier conversations was, I love editing, but I'm also lazy. So I, that he, he loves, he loves the lazy. process, but then he's like, eh, okay, can, now I'm going to let you If I can get to this. the point where like, you know, and I did on Pete's Dragon and it was great. Like I, by the, by the end of it, granted we had a year in post on that, so it was ridiculous. But by the end of it, I was like, I love you to my editor and like you do a great work. I'm going to just disappear for a little while. And, and that was great to have that degree of trust and to know that she would do great work and that she's a great editor and is going to do a fantastic job uh, conveying what it is I want. Um, and I look forward to being lazy in the future with her. Yeah, I mean, right, that's always the goal is to hopefully get to, to that you work with people who are better than you or you can do without or that you they can go and, and learn that and I think or learn who you are and judge something about how you might do it. And that was what was sort of exciting. And also just like the sheer nature of sometimes it's editing can be really laborious. And that's part of what I like about it. But sometimes when you're also thinking about directing and then you're also preparing your next episode or the feature, whatever, there was something nice about I was able to see the footage in a, in a different way, stepping back. So uh, yeah, it just it, I think it depends on each. Like, did you cut Ghost Story? I did. Yeah. Oh yeah. So so it's like that. It's yeah, like that, that one. It would made more like, sense to. I mean, yeah. They would have been tough for someone else to figure out what the heck that movie is. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I found too, uh, like in television, that shooting for the edit was very was like a very good quality. Like all the traits that made that make one a successful indie director, I think lend very nicely to making a successful television director. Um, and I think it partly comes down to the economy of it, right? So you get there, and even though the budget of one episode was the equivalent of all of my movies put together, I was still having to shoot 10 pages a day, or like, you know, on Stanford we were doing like 13, 14 pages a day. So it was one of those things where you, you have those skills to be like, okay, let me see the scene, okay, where can the camera go, where can the edits go, what pieces do you need to work quickly? And, um, and I think that all comes from that same editing space, mind space. Totally. And so you bring up um, a good point. Like, what are outside of budget? What are the biggest similarities and differences between working in indie film and working on a blockbuster film or on on a, a television or episodic work? You just have more people coming into the room to see what you're doing. I mean, that, that for me, that's what it was. Just you, 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 there's a lot more people involved, which is which is fine. I mean, that's just part of the process. And um, other than that there's not really that big of a difference. I mean, there are, there's tons of little ones, but there's nothing, nothing huge. Well, with television, it's a bit different because you don't necessarily have the final cut, you don't necessarily have the final say. So while we're directing, we're thinking of an edit that we hope works out, and it may not end up being that way. And that can be good or that can be bad. I've happily had a nice combination of, you know, them improving on some things and... and and then them keeping, you know, the, the editor and the showrunner keeping some of my favorite stuff. So um, I think there's a the kind of surrender of that kind of control that you, the, you know, that, that's the major difference for me. Yeah, I mean, it's most of what I feel a lot of, I mean, not most, maybe 30%, 40% of what I do is, as a director, is the final, what's, what's the final cut look like? What's the sound mix like? What's the color correction like? What's the score like? I don't do any, you don't do any of that stuff as a, as a director on television. You get four days of post and then you never, 
I won't know what the episodes look like until they're on Netflix. And so it's, and that's not necessarily a negative thing. I think it's about inception and um, David could speak to it better on a big studio movie, but you know, he did a film with a property, right? So that, that, that project started with a property and there's some duty to what that property is or whatever the Disney brand is. When you're doing television, your duty is to the showrunner. The showrunner's duty is to the network and themselves and everything, but you're serving the showrunner. Like you're serving someone bigger than you. It's not like yours in the same way we talk about a tourism, like an indie film or whatever. And so as opposed to indie film, it starts with an idea of yours or a conception of yours. And that's the origin. And when other people come in, you hope they're coming in to help be a part of that. So many times they're not, but you know, the, at least the inception of it starts from a different place. And I think you have to act accordingly. So in television, it was humbling, right? You keep reminding yourself, oh no, this isn't about me. This is about uh, the showrunner. This is about, you know, the network. It's about maybe like six or seven other people before it is about, about you. On the flip side, I'll say that I think the reason that any of us were hired was was because we we had come in, we had demonstrated a strong voice at some point, and they were excited to kind of bring a little bit of that in. Yeah. And so I've kind of I remember just using everything I could to to give them as many ideas for the for the sound for the sound effects for the for the edit, and and I was continuously involved in in the 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 final cut actually just just giving final 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 notes, and and they were welcoming to it. So I think. Depending, of course, on the show, you know, you yeah, can have it depends so much on the. Sh- I hear showrunners yeah. who want the who ask the directors to be in the sound mix. You know, I think okay. it just depends on on the show, yeah. the show to the show. You know. So working in episodic, or uh, you know, uh, big studio films or independent films, editor, or director, it's it's storytelling, right? So, how has your approach to the storytelling process changed, or has it changed moving from being a an editor where you get all the footage and you're having to like build the story from that to moving into being directors and, and approaching or even screenwriters approaching the storytelling process. Has it changed at all or do you feel like one informs the other? I don't know if it's changed so much as you just hopefully are consistently getting better at it. You know, like whether it is telling someone else's story as an editor, which, you know, working as an editor, my hope was always that it would be my story too. Like you want it to be yours. But, uh, but then going into directing and, and, it's never like, you know, nothing changes. You just always hope that you're going to get better at it. And every project, regardless of what it is you're doing on it, you just want to get better at telling those stories. And as the, your facility with, with the, you know, the process grows, you're going to naturally get better at expressing ideas, expressing thoughts, expressing narratives. But, um, but there's no like seismic shift when you move from one sphere to another or anything like that. You're just always just trying to grow. I think my process has always been to fall in love with whatever I'm doing, or at least in strong like um, with whatever I'm doing. And, um, and so that process just continues, and I hope it continues to continue. Yeah, you sometimes have to strong like something to fall in love with it. <laughs> I'm not even talking about filmmaking anymore. Um, <laughs> what did David say? You smash two things together and see what happens. Um, <laughs> the, no, I mean, yeah, it's, it's the same thing. I think it's as the director, uh, the, the biggest difference is the director is that you're responsible for a lot more like we talk a lot when talking a lot about what it's very confusing like what directing is right so like in a lot of ways if the director didn't exist a movie could exist theoretically like i tried this is at least what i tell myself like an actor would show up the ad the assistant director would tell them where to where to stand the dp could frame up the shots the camera operator would operate you know uh, something could exist weirdly like the one person who doesn't have to be there is the one person who has to be there you know and by that i mean that like The job then of the director is to bring in all of those elements, in some cases, studio executives or network executives, and take all of that and try to make sure that the integrity, you know, and by that I mean it's integral, that it all works together. Um, Because how can all those individual pieces be responsible for it to work together? So it's sort of reminding yourself that, at least for me, that, okay, I'm here, so like as an editor, I'm worrying about this thing. I'm worrying about the final product, I'm worrying how it's pieced together, but as a director, I'm worrying about that, as well as, okay, are the actors, I don't want to say happy. Are they content? Are they, is their work good? Are, are the financiers happy? Is the studio happy? Is this, am I navigating what they want versus what I want? You know, there's a lot more politics, I would think. But a lot of editors in television and maybe in films too, they have a lot of politics to navigate because sometimes the final edit falls on their shoulders. So, Here's a fun question. <clears throat> what different types of projects have you guys edited in your past? It runs the gamut. I mean, I'm trying to think of a good... good uh, we, I, one of my favorites is a, a spec commercial for a cable company starring nothing but cats. 
in, in oh, business suits. That'd be a dream. And that's my one of my favorite things I've ever made, to be honest, because I love cats. Um, that was good. I really love that. I cut like a music video once where to get the job, I told the guy I knew how to composite green screen and he wanted to be in the other room the whole time so I had to like learn how to composite green screen while also cutting it and like also pretending the guy really didn't know much. I've, and told, actually, I've told that lie. So yeah and times. it actually kind of turned out okay. I was like oh I was sort of a, a slightly ashamed that it sort of worked but um, yeah I mean music videos and yeah like non videos for nonprofits, weird industrials and commercials and stuff but nothing no no uh, no great little anecdote there. <laughs> you mean paid? Anything, anything. Yeah. My favorite, my favorite little memory is cutting a music video starring myself and my boyfriend at the time. Um, it was footage of me at the comic at Comic Con dressed as um, an anime figure. Um, yeah, I'll find it. We should have gotten those where instead is, of the trailers. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys know? If anyone knows MC Front a lot, um, he's a nerdcore rapper, and I was it was a. I saw, yeah, I, I cut that on Premiere. Be All right. Premiere before Final Cut, before premier, the new Premiere. That was great. That's actually what I, that's, I trained on Premiere, and I think about it. So Jennifer brought up earlier that probably a lot of people in this audience and people watching on the live stream are aspiring filmmakers. Why was it important to cut those, those projects, to, to try your hand at cutting different kinds of content? Uh, it was making a living. I mean, that's really what it was for me. It was a way to make a living um, and gain skills, like by lying and saying I knew how to do compositing the way Kyle did, and then figuring it out. Like it's like, oh, now I know how to do compositing. This is fantastic, and also I can pay rent. So <laughs> it was, it was really that. Like that's what it was. It was a, it was, you know, I learned a lot. It was very educational, but it was primarily a way to make a living. Yeah, just trying new techniques um, that you wouldn't otherwise be able to try on a. Uh, an indie, an indie film or an, or an industrial. Um, and just, I mean, I think as a director, you need to know, even though we, we might have our own singular voice, we also like to be able to tackle different genres and different kinds of music videos. So so being familiar with as many tools as possible, I think, is, a, is always an asset. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not going to lie that it's always been sort of more financially motivated. It's like, on the first film, it was okay, you either get your 18th shoot day or you get an editor. Okay. And I was said, well, I've done enough editing, I'll try it, I'll see, and, um, and I'll get that 18th day. So, I mean, it's each film, it's always been by that, and then it sort of kind of became part of the process. And once I embraced that, then I think I learned, learned more from it. And what about relationships? I mean, were there any relationships or contacts that came out of early projects that have sort of lasted through the years for you? Not in the well, yeah, yeah. Like some, there's a guy who uh, who hired me to do a lot of editing for a show about plastic surgeons in Dallas, um, who was uh, our post super on the Ghost movie. So yeah, there are, and and so a lot of those connections last. Um, and, and a lot of the uh, the folks I you know was were you know in the trenches with on those things are now the producers I work with now because we all were trying to do the same thing, make a living. Uh, doing something that was related to film. So that was, that was where a lot of those relationships were forged, even if we were friends prior to that. I think editing does test your relationships. <laughs> and um, I've survived a few of those uh, editing relationships and I'm still very close to everybody I've worked with. Yeah, I, uh, my, the woman I was editing nonprofit videos for produced my first two films. So, I mean, I think that that was, you know, she had been a, like a big studio producer and we got along really well as I was cutting this stuff for her and I showed her that the projects I wanted to do and so she sort of came out of retirement as a feature producer to do my first two films and uh, yeah, it led to that. I think any kind of job, anything that's sort of involved in this landscape, um, there's always an opportunity to meet people. Uh, film festivals are a really good example of that too and you don't really know to what extent you might end up with working with someone who you just meet or whatever that might manifest itself as later on. So we started off uh, talking a little bit about how um, the filmmaking process has changed, that the integration of VFX has become more important and more integrated. What do you guys think the next five, 10 years will see in terms of where filmmaking will go? 
I know. They were prepped with this question, I, they, so they we, had time we, we to were, think about this. I, we I were told prepped you I it. couldn't answer this question. <laughs> I, no, I, I think it's going to be, I think there's going to be a lot of, and obviously you can just see it happen here every time you come to Sundance, there's more and more VR goggles, you know? Um, for me, I'm I'm interested in experiencing VR. I'm not interested in creating it, you know. So I think, but I think that's going to become one other platform. I think that you know, for people to tell stories, um, whether that be you know, video games or VR or film, and those all kind of merge and overlap in a lot of ways. Um, but I think you know, you you never forget that all 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 filmmaking ever is is you know, the, I forgot the exact definition, but it's the contrast between, you know, two different shots put together. And so, like, that's never going to change, at least as far as in traditional narrative filmmaking goes. Um, even if you're talking about one-take movies, you could argue that still. So it's, um, there's a lot, you know, I think it's about hopefully the technology always supporting the work as opposed to uh, um, mandating or determining the work. You know, you want it to be, I think it took a while, you know, the stuff we're talking about in terms of how VFX and editing techniques can help indie filmmakers. I think it took a long time for that to work as far as like, like when James Cameron started cutting on NLEs and like to the point where now we know how to use that to our advantage. I think it's, I think that it's gonna take some time for stuff to come down to the pipeline, but I do think it's gonna happen like not too long where we're gonna see like a very like beautifully done motion capture character on a like small, on a smaller film, you know, as opposed to on a, as opposed to on a large, as opposed to on a large film, um, and that'll be a really exciting day when that happens. Anybody else? I agree. I mean, I think, I think, I think the you know there will be leaps and bounds in technology, and things will, like you're saying, like motion capture will very quickly become accessible to low budget films. But that's just like the tip of the iceberg. There's going to be things that we can't comprehend. Um, between whether it's leaps in virtual reality, augmented reality, the com, you know, taking video games in a new direction so they actually function more as traditional narratives is something I'm very interested in. Though I haven't seen it yet. And That's where some of the most like interesting yeah, narrative work exactly. being done is is in indie level video games, which yeah. is another. I think that's what it is. I think it's just that the landscape in terms of like I always said if I was like six seven years younger, you know, uh, I probably would have gotten into video game development instead of film. Um, because, and now where you see where people are taking it, it's a really exciting th thing. And you've seen television evolve that way, right? It's changed incredibly rapidly, um, maybe too fast in some ways of what we expect out of a TV show to be and how that overlaps with what filmmaking is and, and those challenges. So I think that that'll, that more and more of that will happen, but I hope still at the end of the day, there's like someone in their backyard with like short ends, you know, piecing together or something that's really great. Yeah, I know, because I, I just like, making traditional movies too much I'm, I'm not ready yet i'm never gonna that's the thing i'm never gonna change like even though when people get mad about watch you know oh someone's watching their phone on their eye movie on their iphone i'm like well it's okay i'm glad people are watching my movies let me start with that second of all you can watch it however you want but i'm still gonna shoot it like it's you know i'm still gonna shoot yeah. it like it's a john ford movie you know exactly. i'm not gonna change the scope of it uh and i you know and i that's i think that's the thing it's like letting it letting the the format grow and change but always going back to the never forgetting the basics I think that I can say that what I'm excited about is because of this, this the increase of access to great technologies that um, op uh, free you up as an artist, uh, I'm more excited about um, the, the, the subject matter becoming a little bit more self-aware and socio-political um, because people from different backgrounds and, and, and means um, can, can create art and, and gain empathy. <laughs> You know, VR is always being talked um, is being talked about as the empathy machine. You know, so yes, that will be one way. But traditional narrative and documentary will continue to be that. I mean, Sundance has obviously shown that that's this is the, the place to to get to understand people outside of your your own bubble. Yeah, I mean, I think some people, you know, with the the topic of democratization of filmmaking, that people grumble about. Oh, well, then everybody's just going to start making film. You know? But really, I feel like it's opening the doors for different voices and different types of of storytelling. And I think that it it allows more voices a platform. Um, I, I think that's been the case. You know, f it's increased over the past few decades, but it's been the case for a long time. Where as the technology becomes more accessible, like those voices start to become heard. And you also have a lot of people like trying it out, like just like, hey, like, movies are easy to make. Let's try making a movie. If they don't like it, they're not going to make another one. If you know, hey, but if they do and they feel compelled to keep doing it, they're going to keep making them and, and those voices will develop and, and be heard. And that's a great thing. 
Which actually brings up a point, um, David, that I thought was interesting in, a, in another conversation about um, failure, the idea of failure or applying to Sundance and not getting in, and, and then what do you do after that? And um, can you guys talk, I mean, did either uh, Kyle, you or Jennifer submit to Sundance before getting in the first time? I didn't get in the first time. Am I the only one that didn't get in the first time? Oh, I didn't get in oh, many, yeah, you're many, many yeah. times. Many, yeah. many, yeah. Uh, I, I didn't, and it was okay. I thought my life was over. I remember I was sitting in the, watching the trailers before Milk was going to start screening, and I got the rejection email, and then I was like, how am I supposed to sit through this movie? <laughs> I was like, oh, I was like so devastated. Um, but the truth was that was maybe one of the best lessons I ever learned. Um, two reasons. One, the world didn't end. My film did get still get seen. It took a little more work, I'm not going to lie, but it still got out there. And secondly, uh, it made me intensely grateful then when I did get in. Uh, I had a contrast, you know, for it. Um, not To not say you can't be grateful for it if you didn't not get in, you know, but uh, in, a, in the long run, um, you know, I learned a lot about that and it, it forced me to go to a lot of other festivals and meet a lot of other filmmakers and sort of open, I mean, what we're talking about here with technology, there's, you're, it's just about knowing your film won't be forgotten. You know, I always say plan, plan for Sundance, don't expect Sundance, you know, it's, and, and frankly, even filmmakers who have had many movies here doesn't guarantee their movie's going to get in. And I think that that's something always to remember that it's, it's always a, it's always a privilege. Um, and, uh, you know, I, that's it. That was the end. I did, my first feature didn't get in the first time I submitted it, but I hadn't finished it. I was like kind of halfway through, and they're like, "Keep going," and uh, you're, you're on the right track. Um, so they've Sundance slowly became my family. I, I don't know if they just felt sorry for me, or but um, because I was trying so damn hard. But um, eventually, I doubt know, that's the case. I don't know. But I think I think what what worked out in terms of like what we saw in each other, me and Sundance, was, was just that we, we we really cared about subject matter and breaking new or trying new things, um, uh, putting on screen people who hadn't been seen before in more complex ways, um, and and that you know I I'd, I'd been a Sundance TV addict when I was younger, and um, and I said this is where I want to be. These people understand me. I understand them. And I just kind of kept, you know, kept working at it. But it's, you know, been an art, been a bit of a journey. And I, if we're, if I'm talking to other, you know, younger filmmakers out there, I, I'm, I'd say strap in because it's gonna, it, it's, it's a lot of work. You know, it's not easy. Yeah, I started submitting short films in high school, and they all got rejected with good reason. I'd stay in hindsight. And, and then I had a feature that got rejected, and that was fine, and played at South By, which was exactly the right home for it, and played around the festival circuit. In fact, I think I played in Greece with Kyle's movie, which is where I saw it. Oh, yeah. yeah I, never, I didn't get to go to there last minute. Yeah, I heard um, that festival's like the best. <laughs> I didn't yeah, get to great. go. But it was great. So like that was, it wasn't a bummer that we didn't get to Sundance, because like, there were other opportunities that came out of it. And in retrospect, it was exactly, like South By was exactly the right home for that movie. It, had, it got the audience it needed and deserved, and, and was a stepping stone for future films to get even wider audiences, and eventually to finally uh, get a short film that was accepted here and then having a feature following that. But, you know, all those rejections, like, kind of strengthen you and inoculate you and, and help you realize that you're in this for the right reason because you're not in this to play a film at Sundance. You're in this to tell stories and to make movies. And and just because you're getting a rejection letter, you know, in the mail does not mean you're going to just give up or stop or that your movies are terrible. It just means that, you know, that wasn't the right fit at the right time and you're just going to let that movie have the life that it needs to have and, and then make another one. And that's a really important lesson to learn from those rejection letters. But you made me think about how once I get a rejection or any time I get a rejection, I do start this process of what, how, could I make, how could I have made or how can I make this better? And I think that's something to not be afraid of ever. Always, yeah. You should. I mean, you don't want to like just like criticize yourself to death, but at the same time, like always look for ways to improve because that's how you're going to grow as, an, as a filmmaker. Awesome. Well, with that, I would like to open it up uh, to questions from the audience or from the live stream. Um, we can take those as well. Uh, yes, right here. I'm, I'm interested in what was lacking in other editing systems that caused this migration for each of you. So the question: This is not a plant. I will tell you right now. 
The question is, what was lacking or, you know, what influenced their decision to choose uh, Premiere Pro for editing their films? I'm sure we have probably exactly the same answer. Maybe. Mine, <laughs> mine was really easy. Mine was the uh, when they changed the pricing structure into the, into the cloud-based system. I just thought, oh, I, I can pay, you know, I, I believe in the, the way that that licensing works. I think it serves the customer better. I think it prevents piracy. I just think everything about when they shifted from the annual release disc that costs this much in the upgrade to the cloud system, I, I was really impressed by that. And it made me perk up and take a second look at the software. And then I was shooting on Red and uh, I loved the idea of editing raw. It was, you know, they were saying, oh, you can edit raw. And I was like, really? You know, on my laptop? And it was all true. It all really worked and it felt like magic to me. So I was like, oh, I'm going to try this. And I, and I loved doing it with the software. It, it was that, and I was already using After Effects a lot. Like, that was my, one of my favorite pieces of software. And so once they started, like, getting bundled together into that subscription, it was easy. But also, like, the language of the software was familiar to me because I'd learned on Final Cut, as many people do. I think we had to give credit to Apple for really breaking down the barriers that was previously, um, you know, the, the, the firewall of Avid, which, you know, Avid's great, too. I've, I know how to use that as well. But I preferred what Apple was doing with Final Cut. I learned on that. It went so far. And then at a certain point, I needed Final to, Cut X. Yeah. <laughs> at a certain point, it wasn't offering what I needed anymore. And, and right around that time, uh, the Creative Cloud kind of just emerged. And it was an easy, easy switch. We're yeah, streaming. It's, it's streaming. We're I just streaming. lost any opportunity to ever get to work with Apple. So. We love but Apple. It, it, it did definitely go from like Final Cut. And weirdly, like it's also was just like... I hate to kind of admit it, but when I was younger, it was like it was like maybe like a it was like a GUI thing, you know, it was like a graphical user interface in a lot of ways. It like looked nicer. I understood oh, totally. yeah. it more, yeah. and and then and I thought that Premiere, once it evolved, became that next step of what I think Final Cut was doing. Still, even still, when I look at like Avid screens, and I've seen Avid work brilliantly and stuff too, but like when I look at the screens, I'm like, oh, it just looks nicer. I understand the way the, the menus aesthetics work. Make a big deal when you're looking at the screen for that. I long. think it was probably build from people that were more of our generation who understood how we started interacting with menus in different ways, whatever it might be. I mean, now now we're going to like the history of like graphical interfaces, but that's <laughs> totally different thing. I agree. Okay. <laughs> Any other? Yes, right here in the front. Um, So the question is, uh, has their uh, experience as editors ever inhibited their directing in terms of like cutting things short because they think they have the coverage? Um. No, I think that <laughs> I think we, I'm greedy. You know, I want my options, so it, it, that will happen first. But the the editing part of me is my asset when I know I'm out of time and out of money. So. You can make that work for you totally. Just don't. The editor shouldn't direct the director. Basically, the director and you shouldn't yeah. like restrict the director and you. That's that's such a good point. Like it should always win out yeah. over the thing. But like I think my biggest problem I have with my films that I've made, and also with like a lot of other indie films that I do see too, and so I'm putting myself into this boat, is like only shooting the pages. Um, and that might come from a little bit of the editor in me or the producer in me where it's like, oh, I'm going to shoot what's on the page because I only have this much time in the day when really some of my favorite moments in the movies I've made have been the accidents and the stuff that you want to cultivate. So it's it's kind of I always have to remind myself, except TV was different, but I have to remind myself. And that's where I hope I grow on my further films is to know, OK, this the script is there to guide us but to not be afraid to let all the other things happen. You know, I become too stringent on just, okay, this is the dialogue and these are the pieces, as opposed to it being a more free form kind of, uh, impro not improvisational, but just having it have, having the set breathe more is something I'm, I'm not good at. Um, but I know you guys are. I mean, I love doing that. And I, to the, the flip side of that is when you spend too much time looking for those things and you're like, oh, we, we got the rest of the scene to shoot too. But, uh, but I think I do sometimes back myself into a corner where like, as you were saying earlier, you've got like, a, if you have a lot of coverage, you're like, okay, I'm not going to use the wide shot. I would never use the wide shot for this part of the conversation. So we'll ju we'll just not cover it, and then you get to the editing. You're like, oh man! <laughs> but, um, but but I also find I can talk to actors a little bit more when they know I'm editing or that I do edit. Oh, I totally. They'll be like, because an actor will be like, oh god, that last line on that take was so bad. I'm be like, I already had. I'll tell them like, I already decided to use that piece, and I know I can cut it in because we're gonna get this little insert. It's great. And it's something that if a director was saying it just that, they would be like, oh, he's probably bullshitting me. But then when I'm like, no, no, I'm also editing it, and I'm gonna do this like tonight when I get home, then they're like more comfortable and feel. And I've good done it on set too, where I've just shown. Yeah. I'm like, here's how it's gonna work, and we just <laughs> cut it together. 
really quickly, and it, and it it does provide a great deal of, of confidence in the ensuing days when you're when you've done that once and they know that you know what you're talking about. So that's like the Soderbergh method, you know. Okay, we have a question from the live stream. So the question is from Christian from Mexico, who is asking, what's the fastest way to learn to be an editor? Yeah, to, to, be to, editor. To, be, to learn to be a good editor. And he also loves visual effects. So does he need to know how to draw in order to be good at visual effects? No. Yeah, you don't need to learn how to draw. Otherwise, I mean... <laughs> so, there you go, but Christian. Yeah, just edit a lot. But just, just, edit, just doing it a lot. Like, as with anything, just do it a lot. Edit a lot and like, try, like, try like, giving yourself little uh, projects like, oh, you know, edit a scene one way. And then like, how, do you, what's the sh how do you do that? What's the longer version of that scene? The shorter version of that? Like, if you don't have that much footage to play with. You know, if you're like, well, I want to edit, but I don't have anything to work with. Go shoot some stuff and then try to piece it together differently. I did an internship at a trailer company a long, long time ago, and they gave me an opportunity to just play with what they had. So I took a trailer and I cut it in a different way and changed the tone, changed the story. Um, that's, a, that's a great way to get... Yeah, cutting trailers is great. It's really, really helpful and educational. I'm t and by the way, like I, I tried cutting a trailer for my first film because it was the same attitude of like, well, we don't have the money, so I'll just do it. And it was so bad. I was so bad at it to the point where I really admire... Uh, trailer editors. Like when I was watching the trailers and stuff today, I was thinking about that. I was like, oh, it's they a have real an skill. impossible job. Yeah. You can also take The Godfather and try to recut it and, and see if you can make a difference to it. Slutterberg does that too. He does his 2001 recut and yep. Psycho recut. But also like the recuts of like, he did the recut of uh, like Days of Heaven and stuff like that, you know, like doing doing recuts of movies otherwise. It, it, that, you, you know, don't post it online because you could get sued unless you're Steven Soderberg, but like, <laughs> D yeah, recut a movie just if you need footage, if you need something to play with. Back here in the white coat. Uh, uh, in general, would you say it's an advantage or a disadvantage if a director is fully in control of the editor? In general, do you think it's an advantage or a disadvantage for the director to be in full control of the edit, meaning like calling every cut or editing it themselves? Editing it themselves. I think it depends on the director, the project, and and if there is an editor or not, the editor. So like, it just really depends. Yeah, it totally depends on the director. It's, it's actually a trick question because it, you know, I mean, it's a personality it thing. It depends totally. on the project too. Like, yeah. what's the kind of movie is it for? I don't know. I'm kind of like a st I'm sort of in staunch opposition to like auteurism. You know, I sort of believe a movie is made by like dozens and hundreds and hundreds of people, and everyone sort of owns a piece of it. So. Um, my, and I mean that some semi facetiously. I understand we need to attribute it to someone, but you know I always have to like get in fights with my lawyers for putting a film buy into my contract because I'm like, no, 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 it's not by me. It's by a, by a lot of people. Um, and so in regards to that, I would say that you just never want to be closed off. You always want to make sure there's other people there. You're surrounding yourself not just in the edit, but in all creative parts of the process with someone who's going to tell you that it's not good, and, you know, or that to tell you to not maybe not good, but say maybe you should look at it this way. You just never want to close yourself off and work in a bubble unless the project for some reason is one where you want that, where there's some experiment or some shape or form to it where you're like, I only want to make this. Like I knew COG was something I was explicitly making more for myself. I knew people wouldn't respond to it and some would. As opposed to Stanford, I was deliberately making a movie that was trying to be a capsule of this like important historical thing that happened that I wanted to speak to brought to more people. I know that um, for Short Turn 12, they did multiple focus groups. Um, I was with, in one of those. Uh, you were. <laughs> um, and, and the director in, in a Q&A talked about how he was just completely egoless about it and they would do surveys and they'd, you know, you know, and we and we so we decided to do the same process for Avantages. We just had as many focus groups as we could because, you know, we wanted to know what was working, what wasn't, and what were the what were the common problems, and and and, and that you know that's the process we embraced, and I think we benefited from benefited from. But I, but there are certain situations, depending on who's controlling the focus group, you have to watch out for those because depending on your collaborators, you can end up with a situation where. The, the person who's controlling the makeup of the, of, the, of the focus group could be trying to push the film their way. So just be very conscious of the kind of audience you're trying to, to achieve, uh, trying to reach with your film. 
We have another one from the live stream. Um, how do you defend your ideas and edits when someone else is calling the shots so the bosses don't change everything at the end? So, so, <laughs> State that again? <laughs> How do you defend your uh, decisions or edits when you're not in charge? Like if there's a boss that's ultimately has final say. Uh, I mean, it's tricky. I mean, with, with television, which you both have more experience. I've only done one television episode where there was no final say for me. But like with, with like doing a studio movie, it was, you know, there wasn't that much defense to do. It was more like, like let's just make this good. And once it was good, people weren't like asking us to change anything. And we did do a we did a, we did a test screening, and that was helpful. And there were a couple of things that we learned from that, but there was never a sense of like having to defend something or prove a point for us. I have a way more maybe negative point of view. I've had I've had people uh, getting into the edit room and trying to make very big decisions that would have been very detrimental, you know, m to the extent of like putting voiceover over a whole movie or whatever it might be. Um, and in those cases, uh, in one case, uh, the movie got into Sundance, therefore giving me the leverage to uh, f argue against them, um, uh, which was very satisfying because it helped. But at the same time, I still would have fought. You know, you, there, there, there's always fights. Like, I mean, Final Cut isn't something that really exists. Like, very few people alive really have fine. They might have Final Cut in their contracts, but with the reality of what that Final Cut means, when you have a studio that says, they can be like, well, fine, you have Final Cut, but then we're only going to put your movie out in 10 screens or whatever it might be. There's always, you always have someone to answer to unless you have deep pockets and you can go make your own films, which would be great. But at the same time, like, you kind of always have to embrace that it takes other people. You have other people giving you money. And if someone gives you a money, give, gives you a money. If someone gives you money, they want to answer, they're going to have some say, typically, 95% of the time. Um, they're going to want some involvement. And so it's about, being egoless and hopefully working with, you have to take a risk. And they're taking a risk on you and you're taking a risk on them. And that can backfire sometimes. And you hear nightmare stories and sometimes movies get buried because of it. But if the choice is between taking that risk and not making movie, I'm going to take the risk. Would you say pick your battles? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, don't, like, if they're, like, if you get, you know, you learn this even on a writing level, though, once you start getting notes and network notes and studio notes, like, if, if you get 20 notes and, like, 10 of them are little things you can live with, do those 10 things and then the other ones, you know, push against a little bit and be like, well, you know, then like eight of those other 10, you like, well, maybe I can do this. And then the other two at the end go, I'm not going to do that. And then they'll hear, oh, okay, well, they're giving me, they're listening to me. And you always just want to make sure that the notes are always making it better. And when it reaches the point that it's not, and you're not able to do something to change, turn that note into something that'll make it better, then that's when you have to start laying down the law and hoping it all works out and that your movie won't be an Alan Smithy film. What's worked best for me is staying extremely positive and then and and being as honest I can about the emotional intent of the scene, and just and that honesty somehow has worked, um, because then they start listening. Uh, yeah, I agree. Like I always try. Like you know, I I do get notes. I do get you know, regardless of whether it's like a little movie I paid for myself or a giant studio movie, I'm getting like notes all through the whole process. But I try not to look at it as a bad thing. I try to. You know, I've luck luckily had collaborators on both of those fronts that I really trust and really get along with. And I've had the bad experience too, and I don't want to talk about that here. But I, but, but the good experiences like turn into the situation where when you were getting those multiple points of view, it's not a bad thing. It's all cumulatively building towards a better film. And as Kyle said, like you don't have to agree with everything. You can push back on things if someone gives you a note that you don't like, like explain why and then try it out. And maybe sometimes you were wrong and it turns out that that note makes the movie so much better and you're like, thank goodness I tried it, you know? Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, I'm gonna go up there, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, for a young editor, what is a, a skill that uh, the panelists would recommend focusing on first before they try getting into other parts of editing that are more advanced? Uh, you know, like I almost feel like just watch a lot of movies and <laughs> like and like be, be able to talk about things in a cinematic level if that's what you're looking to do is edit film, um, because I do think the software is imminently learnable and 
and that's something you can go home tonight and download and, and learn it, and by next week you'll be pretty good at it. You know, in terms of like pressing the buttons, using the tools, but like having that that cinematic vocabulary, especially if you do want to work in film, is um, is hugely important. And so I, that, that's where I'm going. That's where I'm going. I'm just saying, watch a lot of movies. I think for me, a, a valuable lesson was learning the difference between a subjective and objective point of view, and learning how to cut that. Um, kind of seen that way or knowing what you're doing when you're doing it read in the blink of an eye if you haven't uh lit i mean a people should just read that book even if they're not interested in yeah, editing that's great but and his other I, one yeah exactly like that's you, I mean, you have to start there um and then by walter merch yes sorry I, he's not familiar with it. um and and then i think on the on the flip side of that i would say try only using like one tool i mean i've cut an entire movie just off of using the slice tool and just doing it that way like don't get caught up in the I mean, you know, if you say Premiere has all these things, this mountain of things, the, the, you know, like I've always been saying, the simplicity of it, sometimes you only need those two things at the top and everything else there is to support those. And so reminding that and challenging yourself and not getting caught up in, in dissolves or effects or jumping too deep into the t all the advanced tools or anything, like don't get overwhelmed by that and just try working just with like in and out and then putting it into a timeline and seeing how that goes. I mean, I've never put, I, I, I do that on my films. I always try to start off with, a fade, a fade in and a cut to black. Everything I've made other than tell, uh, my three movies started with a fade in and a cut to black and there's never been a dissolve, there's never been a uh, a title, or a, not that those are wrong, but I've always tried to start with that. Start with the most like basic grounded thing and then let those other things be something that helps tell the story. But that's I think that's different because there's also films that have millions Star of dissolves. for the win. Yeah, exactly. Like there's that, That's not to say that that's the best way, but I think starting with that, the most like basic approach, you know, uh, and then you build, you know, it's like learning the rules to break the rules. Wonderful. Well, thank you, David, Jennifer, and Kyle so much for being here. And thank you all for joining us, everyone on the live stream. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.